Here to talk to us about what's on his radar this year, Tim O'Reilly. My first question is whether Allison made that comment about t-shirts and suits just for me. <laughs> I, I just got back from DC and this is the suit I was traveling in. I bought it in Bangkok, I think, at a 2004 meeting that Denise Cooper organized. Uh, and I ha but I have to say that uh, I've only worn it three or four times since. So those of you who know O'Reilly know that uh, my blog is called The O'Reilly Radar. It's a little bit of a homage to Radar O'Reilly on MASH, the guy who tried to anticipate what you needed. And as a result, I'm often talking about things a long time ahead of the curve. So back in 2002, we did a conference called Building the Internet Operating System. A little bit later on, uh, we came up with a, a new name for it, which caught on much better, which was Web 2.0. But that original concept was the key one that's driven my thinking for the last 10 years. We are building an operating system for the internet. So I'm going to talk to you today a little bit about a few ideas of what I'm seeing right now uh, in that realm, what is coming together. And then I'm also going to talk about uh, one of my big focuses right now, which is uh, the work I'm doing uh, trying to help the folks in Washington think about technology policy. So I'm going to start, you guys, if you know me, you know I like quotes. I'm a literary guy. I'm going to start with T.S. Eliot, who said, we shall not cease from exploration. At the end of our exploring will be to arrive where we started and know the place for the first time. This is a great skill to have, to kind of look at things that you have come to take for granted in technology. There's a lot of what I do. I, I look at something and I say, whoa, there's a lot of meaning in that. And so right now, I want to talk to you about pizza. All right? And in particular, I want to talk to you about a search for pizza with the Google mobile app for iPhone or other smartphones. Now, it's a pretty remarkable application, not because it works so well, in some ways, it's a little, my, my brother likes to tease me because I bake pies, and he says, it's kind of like a dog baking. I know it's sort of remarkable because uh, I'm doing it. Uh, and the fact that, that this speech recognition is there, it's still in early stages. But yet, it works decently. But think about what happens when you pick up the phone and you say, pizza. And it comes back with local results. Pizza My Heart on 117 East San Carlos. Pizza Chicago on 155 West San Fernando. La Nostra Pizza at uh, 801 First Street. I mean, that's sort of miraculous. But what's really going on there? You know, first of all, there's an application running on a mobile device whose interface is driven by sensors. So think about sensors. They're a huge part of the coming world. Mobile devices, it's not just that they're phones, that they're mobile. They're a collection of sensors. This thing has a touch screen. It's got motion and proximity sensors. Literally, in that Google mobile app, when you put it to your ear, it goes into speech recognition mode because it feels the motion. Right? And then the microphone is just listening. Right? And then, of course, it knows where you are. All of you know that applications are increasingly working in this idea that they can, in fact, detect your location. But it's also an application that depends on cooperating cloud data services. And this, this is the really important part, and the part I want you to put in the context of that T.S. Eliot quote, of just understanding what is going on and how important it is. The speech recognition is not happening on the phone. That's number one. But more than that, it's untrained speech recognition. Now, untrained speech recognition typically happens uh, in circumstances where there's a limited vocabulary. So a company like Nuance, which is a, a leader in, in uh, speech recognition, will do things like medical transcription. They know all the words that people are likely to say. So I was talking with someone at Nuance about uh, the Google mobile app and the speech recognition. And this is the point that just blew my mind. He said, well, really, it isn't um, untrained speech recognition. It isn't uh, unconstrained speech recognition because they have another database, namely search. They know what people are likely to be saying. And that's why they can do speech recognition pretty well. And it's this coordination between multiple senses that I want you to think about because that's where we're starting to get towards an internet operating system. 
because this application is based on these cooperating databases. The speech is better because they know what people are likely to be searching for. And then, of course, location tells them how to, how to filter the results. So when you look at some of the cutting-edge Android applications, this is one that came out last year. It's kind of a wiki travel guide. Now think about how that works or how that will work in the future in the context. First of all, the camera, again, being used as a sensor and with a heads-up display, looks at something. Well, gosh, you know, that obelisk, that could be the one in, uh, in Paris or maybe it's the Washington Monument. Well, how do you know? Well, of course, if you know where you are, the image recognition gets a lot easier. Right, so again, cooperating senses. So I really think we're heading very quickly, much more quickly than anyone expects, to a, an augmented reality world where first our phones, but later the kinds of wearable computing um, interfaces that researchers have been playing with for, for decades are going to come into mainstream. Well, we'll be looking around and we'll be getting information about the things we see because the camera is a sensor, the location is a sensor, and coordinated cloud databases are going to deliver powerful new applications. So I don't know how many of you have played with face recognition uh, in iPhoto or on uh, 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 Google, Google's, uh, all of a sudden I'm having a brain fart, uh, Picasso. Um, but it's, it's not great. You have to train it. This, by the way, is my daughter and my new grandson, of whom I'm very proud. Uh, but it's, uh, you know, it's kind of fabulous. You look at it, it recognizes the face, and then it, it kind of says, hey, is this Huck? I'm training it on uh, uh, you know, my grandson's face. Now, again, pretty hard problem. But start thinking about these cooperating data systems. What if you had face recognition plus a social network plus a location? becomes a heck of a lot easier. You're not trying to pick a face out of millions. You may be trying to pick a face out of the thousand odd people who are here. And of course we have this social network. If you're part of it, you've uploaded your picture. Um, so we're going to be moving to a world where uh, a lot of science fiction is going to be coming uh, into our lives. And of course, open source developers are at the forefront of this. There's a lot of, of interesting activity happening um, uh, on the Android phone in this area because they were the first to have some of the, the most accurate sensors, um, and, but also really happening on the, on the cloud front. But if you th realize that the internet operating system that we're building is a data operating system, you take certain things very seriously and you ask yourself, okay, if these are the subsystems of that OS, location, identity, search, buying and selling, behavior patterns, weather, speech recognition, image recognition, you know, who should own these databases? They're all databases that actually get better the more people use them, and there's a natural tendency towards monopoly. And that's something we really have to worry about in the open source community, because even though a company like Google is built on top of Linux, the databases that they use are the real source of their, of, of their power. And we, so we start, need to ask ourselves, should all these data services be centralized or federated? Um, I was in a planning call for a, a panel that I'm on later with uh, Evan Prodromo of, of Identica and Bradley Kuhn of, of uh, Software Freedom Law Center. Actually, did I get you wrong? Where are you, Bradley? I forget. <laughs> uh, but uh, uh, we're going to be talking about some of these issues. But there was a great line that came up from in that conversation, which was, federation is maybe the new open source. And of course, so think about uh, how whatever services you build can be federated. I do see signs of hope. Uh, back in 1994, I published a book, uh, which is now long forgotten because it became obsolete pretty quickly. It was called The Directory of Electronic Mail Addressing and Networks. Back in 1994, we had to publish a book that explained how you gateway email from one system to another. There were 180 incompatible email networks. And that ended. And I think social networks are going to go the same route. It doesn't make sense for them not to become federated. And so I think there's going to be some interesting uh, activity in that area. And of course, we can move it all forward. But I want to move from there to the idea that we have an unlikely ally in moving the open data platform forward. It's this guy, Barack Obama. Because on the very first day he was in office, he published something he called the Open Government Directive in which he said that he wanted government to be transparent, uh, collaborative, and open. And his new CIO, Vivek Kundra, 
you know, said this in an interview with me, he said, we're going to be publishing government data beginning with a default assumption that information should be available to the people. That is a huge shift. And there's even activity going on in Washington where people are starting to say, hey, you know, isn't source code data? And if the government pays for it, shouldn't that data be in the public domain? You know, so there's some really interesting movement afoot there and some very, very clued in people in Washington. A lot of smart geeks showing up there. I, I was at a brainstorming meeting at, at the FCC with the new FCC commissioner. And who's there but Anil Dash in a suit, you know? <laughs> Which was, you know, for those of you who know Anil, it was slightly um, yeah, unexpected. Uh, the uh, Vivek Kundra has, has put together this site called data.gov which is really a catalog. It's the first attempt of the, of the US government to put together an SDK, if you like, of all their APIs. Uh, it's still a work in progress. Um, but folks like the Sunlight Foundation are trying to organize developers uh, to actually start to build applications against that. And we're having really good conversations with the team there about how do we actually start looking at um, encouraging development against all these APIs, figuring out which ones are the most important. And also building the economy around this open government uh, uh, platform. You know, a really great example that Anish Chopra, the new federal CTO, gave in a talk uh, uh, at the Open Government Innovation Conference, where I also spoke yesterday, was the Postal Service in name resolution, starting to be an API for e-commerce sites where you can kind of check, yeah, this is the correct address. You think about the role the Postal Service could play in social networking. Of course, you also think about the privacy implications, and there's a lot of problems to solve there. But that's why we've been supporting the Sunlight Foundation in our uh, conferences. We've got the Sunlight Hackathon here all, all three days of the conference. We'd love to have you uh, be part of that, help build applications that matter. Now, it's really important, when I've talked to both Vivek and Anish, uh, these two top IT guys now for the federal government, what they're telling us is we have a year to make a difference. You know, our boss has put our asses on the line. You know, he's saying all this openness stuff matters, and we've got to deliver on that promise for him. And I'm taking that message to you. We have got to deliver on that promise, because, you know, another year or two, you know, the political campaign cycle's back on. We may have missed the window. So we've got to show that this stuff really makes a difference. Being open actually helps that we can revive the economy, we can get innovation happening, that we can build new services. So I really urge you to get involved. It's also why we're announcing today uh, a new organization called Open Source for America. I'm uh, a, a, an advisory board member. There are a number of people here in the audience who are much more deeply involved than I am. Uh, but it's really an advocacy group in Washington. Uh, designed to help encourage uh, the adoption of open source. Because again, there is a real openness now in Washington to look at fresh approaches to technology. Uh, it's really quite remarkable. Uh, that's also why I'm, I've organized a couple of conferences there. We're, we're, we're doing something in September called the Gov20 Summit and the Gov20 Expo Showcase, uh, featuring innovation in government. Now, a lot of people there are thinking about Gov20 as social media. And that's certainly part of it. You know, you see Obama using YouTube and uh, his con Congress people on Twitter and so on. Certainly a lot of focus on transparency and that matters. They're starting to get a clue about rapid application development. They're struggling painfully with the procurement system, which blocks things. And I'll give you a, a quick example. I won't mention names uh, from, from the, the, but if, federal official was telling me that because of requirements, they've got to actually keep a snapshot of all their social media activity. And this person, being technically clued in, said, oh, I know how to do that. I'll just reach out to Brewster Kale at archive.org, and they can just kind of do what they do with the Wayback Machine for the White House. Easy, right? Six months later, or actually it's not six months, I guess it is six months. Six months later, no love. They can't get it through a procurement, even though it's a tiny amount of money. And so what they've still got is two interns taking screenshots every day, right? You know, because the procurement is such a nightmare. And so there's a lot of people, you know, trying to figure this out. How could we actually build a system where 
the people with the right skills from our community can work on individual projects without having to be part of the whole you know, DC contracting ecosystem uh, because it's very locked in. And so that's one of the big challenges that I'm trying to get my brains around. But there's really good signs too. They put out an RFI for cloud computing. And one of the coolest things about it, there were 25 questions for vendors and five of them were about interoperability and how the vendor would prevent lock-in. That was awesome. 20% of all the questions that they were asking vendors to you know, answer were about uh, openness and interoperability. And of course, so open source and government, big issue. But the biggest thing I've been thinking about as I have been exploring this idea of Gov2.0 is the idea of government as a platform. Because we've forgotten that government is actually a means of collective action. I've been reading some of the biographies of the founders, and amazing reading about Benjamin Franklin. Now, he was the guy who started the matching grant, for example, uh, you know, where citizens would raise a certain amount of money and the government would match it. He ran a volunteer fire department. He, he ran the first one in America. You know, he put together libraries and schools, and you know, he was really about citizen action. And somehow we got into a different idea, which a guy named uh, Donald Kent calls vending machine government. You know, we put in our taxes and out come roads and schools and police and fire services. You know, and we think that our job as citizens is perhaps, uh, you know, to, to let the spending keep in increasing. You know, we've gone from, you know, 6% to nearly 40% of GDP at all as, as uh, uh, the cost of, of all levels of government. But we have to get that collective action means more than collective complaint. You know, we think that collective action means doing a march or signing a petition. You know, this is a little bit like shaking the vending machine, right? That's not what it's all about. So there's a story that I saw and blogged about back in April that was just a fascinating story that I thought really was the heart of Gov2.0. It was a story about a road that was washed out in a state park in Hawaii. The government said, that's going to cost us $8 million to fix it. We just don't have it. Well, there were a bunch of lo local, locals who said, whoa, this is going to devastate our economy. They got out and they fixed the road in a week. You know, they raised some money, they put it together, collective action at work. So I, the blog I did at the time was, was DIY on a civic scale, and uh, Scott Heiferman of Meetup said, no, no, it's not DIY, it's DIO, do it ourselves. And of course, wasn't that the original uh, mission of the Free Software Foundation? You know, long before it was the GNU operating system, it was just, give us the source code so we can fix it ourselves. That was where Richard started uh, the whole idea of free software, and I think it's really central. Do it ourselves is the heart of Gov2.0. And the platform that we are asking the government to build is a set of tools and services that help us to do it ourselves. And I think as we take our principles of open source and web development and all the wonderful technologies we built, what we really want to help the government rethink is, is how to make it easier for the people to create innovation, to make new things happen, uh, to solve problems without government. The government may be a convener, it may be a provider of leverage, but it's not really the provider of the finished service. And that's a lot of what I'm trying to help them think through. So that's the real lesson of open source and web tool for government. Give us the tools and we can do it ourselves. But that means that what I want you to do is, if, you, if you're interested in Washington, don't just lend your voices, lend your hands, lend your coding skills. There are a lot of opportunities uh, for technical people to contribute, and the Sunlight Hackathon is uh, probably a great start. But also go to that OSA, uh, Open Source for America webpage, sign up, you'll be informed, you'll be able to uh, uh, start to engage in what I think is an unprecedented opportunity uh, to remake uh, the way our government uses technology to build a better country for us. Thank you.